Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We're going to continue our conversation this week on vulnerabilities and zero days and patching and all of that, that we've kind of talked about for the last few weeks. I found another article that talked about risk centric security. And so part of the issue is organizations are struggling to keep up with how many vulnerabilities there are these days. If you have a standard traditional vulnerability scanner and you scan your environment, you're probably going to come up with a massive report of different vulnerabilities of applications, of operating systems, of firewalls, of everything that you have, IoT devices, you know, OT devices. And so there has been reports that say there's a jump of 24% of new vulnerabilities that are being exploited in the wild. And CISA issued an alert a couple months ago that talked about how malicious cyber actors are targeting internet internet facing systems such as email servers and VPNs. And they're trying to exploit the newly disclosed vulnerabilities. And so from their data, they found that the most of the top exploited vulnerabilities are actually POCs or proof of concept codes that researchers and other people have released within the last two weeks. And so as soon as those POCs, you know, the the code goes up on GitHub, these cybersecurity, these cyber criminals are utilizing it and trying to exploit it right away. And so it's, you know, very important to try to get those patched. But like I said, the problem is, there's just so many. So how do you deal with that? One of the things that I am working on is within Microsoft, there's a program called Leap, which is a program to recruit and develop unconventional talent, people who are perhaps changing industries or jobs and they want to transition into tech, or maybe it's a stay-at-home parent who has been out of the workforce, who wants to join the workforce again and get into tech. And I'm helping them develop a cybersecurity curriculum to try to train more cybersecurity talent in the industry. And as I was working on the curriculum, part of it was the vulnerability management. And I was tasked to come up with a lab for this particular lesson plan. And in my brainstorming of ideas one of the ideas is we should give the students a vulnerability report with all the cvs scores and maybe give them a list of assets that you're using and how you're using it and then have them figure out a remediation plan based on you know how severe the vulnerability is based on the application that's being used or the operating systems or the servers or the firewalls because most organizations when they take a vulnerability report they can't fix all of the vulnerabilities that are there it's too much and so you have to look at it from a risk-based standpoint and that's where this article was talking about is that each vulnerability comes with a CVSS or a common vulnerability scoring system, but that just kind of gives you a general idea of how bad it is. It doesn't necessarily consider how the vulnerability is going to be exploited within a certain environment. And so most organizations are left dealing with this list of vulnerabilities that may be like, you know, 10.0, 9.9, but they don't really know how it's going to be used in their, envi- in ver- in their environment. And so, you know, measuring out what you have, how you're using it, and then essentially scoring it. And an analogy I tried to use is if you have a bunch of things in your house that you need to fix, how would you go about doing that? If you had a limited budget, you had limited time, you had limited skill set. You know, if there's a 
furnace issue and your furnace is broken before winter, that's obviously a massive issue. Or if your roof is leaking and it's creating structural damage, I mean, that needs to be done, right? But if there's like a room that needs to be painted, that's not as severe. And so I'm using that analogy to try to say, you know, try to rank the vulnerabilities. And so that's the idea. I think most organizations are trying to move to this. And if you're new to vulnerability management, this is the way that I think you should approach how to run the program. When you use that home analogy, I think we can almost take it one step further in what you're talking about. When you, when you move from a severity based mindset to a risk based mindset, right? Because let's, let's go back to your analogy for a second. We could have the worst paint flaking, falling off the wall ever. It's a 10 on the PVSS, the paint vulnerability, you know, security scale, uh, that it's really bad paint, but it's not necessarily a risk to us. We can still live in that home, even with the paint falling off the wall versus we could have a pipe that has a pretty small leak. It's not a huge severity leak, but any leak is a bad problem in terms of risk. Right. And so I think like, I think it's a good analogy, but even taking it one step further, that severity just tells you like how bad it is in the context of like a vulnerability. This could be a really bad vulnerability, but we use it on one system that's air gapped in our environment. Okay. Maybe not as big of a concern as this thing that scored way less than CVSS, but we have deployed on 20,000 devices. Right. I mean, like, I think that's what you're getting at, Andy, as far as using additional context above and beyond just what's the severity to what's the actual risk to our business is, is, am I on the right track with what? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so the article talks about like five different things that you can look at when you're using a risk-based approach. And one of them you talked about here, which is attack surface visibility, right? If you have 20,000 systems with a specific vulnerability, that's probably a higher attack surface than the one system that's air gapped with a severe vulnerability Mm -hmm. attack simulation, which is pen testing. And so we've talked about this and and not only do you need to have vulnerabilities and remediate them, but then you need to pen test to make sure that everything else is remediated. And that goes around in a circle because they'll find things that you haven't remediated or a different way to get in. And then you patch that and then you go back and forth. And so tax simulation, very, very important as part of a risk-based approach. Exposure management, you know, that's more like if you're breached already, like how do you minimize that exposure and how do you minimize that breach to minimize your risk? And, you know, they talk about here, actual risk reduction is focusing on eliminating the threats that matter Um, And so more cybersecurity leaders are coming to terms with the fact that not all vulnerabilities are created equal. And so even if you have a breach, if you've contained it and they're not laterally moving and they haven't gotten to the crown jewels, that's probably as best as you can hope. Right. And so that's the risk reduction and remediate those systems and you move on. So I think, this article was, was pretty good to look at and it's, it's good to think through. I think a lot of senior leaders today have that mindset, but if you're looking at putting a vulnerability management program together, you haven't done it. Once you start getting into it, I think you're going to find that it may be overwhelming because of the list of vulnerabilities that you're going to get the report that you're going to get. And you need to figure out how you're going to remediate them in a manner that, you're not going to get overwhelmed, right? So another article that I found that was interesting that I want to talk about is there's um, this article talked about a report that over 70 organizations have an existing set of security controls that may prevent or detect or even back up your data and servers. But out of those organizations that were surveyed, over 40% of them have been hit with a ransomware attack and 
70% have experienced one in the last five years. So 40% in the last year, 70% in the last five years. And so even if you have solutions in place, security controls and protection deployed, the, the fact is you're still vulnerable. And c- uh, cyber criminals are now really pivoting to not only hitting you with ransomware, but also siphoning that data prior to encryption. Data exfiltration during ransomware attacks is now up 106% relative to where it was five years ago. And so the tactic is very common now is where they steal your data, then they encrypt your data. And if you have a backup solution and you're not willing to pay the decryption, they'll just say, hey, we have your data and we're just going to release it if you don't pay us. And so there's a backup method of trying to get you to pay them because it's, you know, if you if you don't have a backup solution, you got to pay to decrypt. But if you do and you're like, I'm not willing to pay, then they're just going to release your data into the wild. And so we have to really shift as protectors into that data protection mindset so even if we have a backup solution, even if we have security controls in place, I think that missing piece that a lot of organizations aren't really doing is data protection, whether it's disk encryption or it is the encryption on the, at the file level. You know, there's a lot of different solutions that can encrypt f- the files themselves that even if they travel someplace, you'll need credentials to unlock them. Like for example, Microsoft information protection, that's just one of the solutions that are out there, but you can have a file that's encrypted using your M365 credentials. So I think that's really the next step because if you're an organization and you're thinking about trying to reduce your risk of, you know, business losses, right? The data is really the, the next step if you haven't thought about that yet. So this survey comes from a company that <laughs> is definitely doing a little bit of peddling their own goods here as part of it, but that's life in cybersecurity, right? It was uh, titanium, but spelled a T-I-T-A-N-I-A-M instead of I-U-M. Uh, and, and Andy kind of took out the parts where they pounded their own chest about the the world's leading, blah, 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 data protection, whatever it was. The the survey results here are interesting. And I think they go back to a point I've made several times in that there is definitely groupthink in cybersecurity that if you kind of do this thing and follow this strategy, then you will be protected. And I have often raised kind of just the point on this show to say, you know, how's that working out for everyone um, this survey results kind of backs up that uh, we'll call it the uh, the Brewer doctrine <laughs> uh, that that perhaps you know traditional thinking is not actually working that well in cybersecurity and we could use some uh, diversity of approach and see if we can find a better way. Uh, certainly, with seventy percent of organizations having a set of prevention detection backup solutions and that 40% of them have still had ransomware in the last year and 70% have had a ransomware one in the past five years. That's significant. You know, that's, that's suggestive that the, the tools alone aren't doing the job, which we know. I mean, we talk on this show all the time of tools are great. Andy and I sell tools, but you certainly need to do the basics too. And, and how important that is. So I think ultimately you kind of make a good point, Andy, that, uh, encryption at the file level that provides protection wherever the data goes. That's a valuable um, piece of the puzzle that can prevent uh, some of these double extortion attempts where they extort you to decrypt. And then if you're like, now nah, we're good, we got this, we have backups. Then they say, all right, well now we're going to extort you to not release your data. If you had that encryption at the file level, they may not have been able to bypass that depending on, you know, how much time they had in your environment or whatever. I mean, if they got access to administrative controls, they may have been able to decrypt it anyways. But anyhow, you know, it's another, it's adding cost and complexity to that, to the attack, which 
is, is always kind of our goal. It's not to make it impossible. It's to make it unattractive. Right. Um, so certainly some interesting results here for sure. And I want to make it clear that I'm not advocating for encrypting all of your data. No, do not do that. (laughs) I have implemented encryption for email before and, you know, way, way back when I was a green, you know, just starting out in cybersecurity and I was like, let's encrypt everything. I tried encrypting all of our emails between the cybersecurity team because I thought, hey, we're the cybersecurity team. We should have encryption on their email. That was a terrible idea. It is a really high overhead and it certainly is not needed for every single thing. So you should have encryption in place for your users to be able to self dictate, you know, if you think that this is internal only, or they want this to be read only or do not forward or something like that. Um, That should be in place as well as maybe, you know, take it a step further and you have maybe a, a data loss protection or DLP solution that can sense sensitive words. There's a lot of different solutions out there, but certainly the technology exists that you can scan documents and emails, file shares, and see certain sensitive words, keywords, social security numbers, credit card numbers, um, you know, project Adam Brewer, you know, if, if it has project Brewer in it, you can, you know, encrypt it at a certain level. And so that technology exists today. And that's certainly something, you know, that's the step further where it's more like automatically classifying, but certainly self-classification is something that I would trust my users to do. Microsoft trusts us to do it all the time. Um, You know, for my email, I can say, this is internal only. I could say, do not forward. So those are very simple things that you can do just to an, empower your users to have some level of protection that has saved my bacon a time or two where if I'm having a conversation that I don't want a customer to see, because maybe we're discussing something internal that's not allowed to be shared with a customer. I make sure to classify it as a sensitivity that's Microsoft FTE only. And then even if one of my peers isn't really paying attention to the thread and attempts to add the customer back to the thread, it won't let them. Or if they do send it to the customer, the customer can't read it. And so that has absolutely been helpful a time or two, um, just just adding another layer of protection. But kind of going back to the um, initial point you just made, Andy, about do not do this for everything. That's mm-hmm. that's the whole thesis of the podcast tonight is not everything is high severity. Not everything is high risk for you. And the same is true of your data. Not everything is that sensitive that it should be encrypted and all of the downsides that go with that. If you can't look at something and make a decision on how sensitive it is, that's where you need to start is being able to make that decision um, and being able to determine the, the sensitivity of it. And that's the same thing we're talking about with being able to look at the severity of something and being able to map that to the risk to your organization. So it all comes full circle here on determining your relative risk of any one thing. And when everything's high severity or high priority, then nothing is right. And cybersecurity professionals get that better than anyone because everything in cybersecurity is a fire drill. And for us to all be successful as an industry, we got to get out of that mindset. Brilliant, Adam. I love how you tied it together. (laughs) The last thing that I just wanted to mention is it goes along with our data protection and kind of data leakage protection. Microsoft announced that the idle session controls or session timeout controls are now generally available for M365. And so some of you who may have EMS E3 or M365 E3 and you have conditional access controls, you can, you may be thinking, well, I have those conditional access session controls already. There is one called sign-in frequency, which you can use to force a user to sign back in 
to re-authenticate to a session. And that certainly is still there. This is a little bit different because it doesn't have to do with Azure and conditional access. This allows organizations who don't own conditional access, who may just be office, you know, O365, to have that capability to scope idle session timeouts within the admin portal of Microsoft 365. So it's a nice and easy way that you can say if someone has been idle within Office, like Word, Excel, Outlook on the web, OneDrive on the web, really like I think about a lot of Adam and you know my customers that we talk to who are manufacturing customers who are on shop floors and they have shared kiosks and one person logs in and then they walk away and then their email is still up and then another person walks up. And so how do you prevent that person from you know leaking their data? And so this is super easy. You just go to the admin portal in M365 and you're able to scope these idle session timeout policies for your web apps. Andy, I think you hit all the details. I'll just add one additional note. The key word here for difference in experience is idle. So the session controls in conditional access, you talked about sign-in frequency. That is regardless of if you're idle or not. You could be active. And if the sign-in frequency is set to one hour, even if you've been banging away for an hour, it's going to say, oh, time to sign in again. It has nothing to do with idle time versus this is you signed into SharePoint online or OneDrive for business, or you're editing an, a document in like Word Online, Word in the web, and you walk away from the PC for X length of time, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, this is where it can sign that user out automatically if they don't respond to like a prompt that says, are you still there? Kind of like Netflix does. And then, um, you know, then the next, the, when that user returns or another user comes up, they have the opportunity to sign in again. So uh, just a nice additional control is, is you know, uh, on topic with data leakage and, and reducing risk and all of that. Here's a, a simple way to reduce some of the risk of those, those applications remaining open longer than you had intended. Good point, Adam. Thanks for making that <laughs> distinction. It's just another way to think about it, mm-hmm. right? Forcing a user to re-authenticate while they're active, kind of making sure that that session is still valid and that person is still there versus them walking away and saying, are you there and signing them out? You know, it's just a different way to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, Both are valid ways to kind of help make sure that uh, the session is still valid. And if you read through the documentation on this, which we will link to in the show notes, you'll note that there are certain scenarios where this is basically not supported. And several of them are, um, scenarios like for, for trusted devices, um, the default behavior is that this won't fire in those scenarios. So like if this is Andy's, you know, workstation, um, and we trust it because it's as hybrid as already joined or whatever. Um, in some of those scenarios, it may not fire. So make sure you read the documentation thoroughly to understand where this does and does not apply. Um, and just one final note, I'll get on my soapbox for a second. Frequent reauthentication is not actually a security benefit. Um, sometimes that gets misconstrued. It is absolutely valuable that if a user walks away from a device that it automatically locks itself, it automatically signs them out of things uh, to prevent you know somebody from walking up to an, an unattended device and gaining access. That is valuable. However, we need to balance that against frequent reauthentication because that actually is, is not only a security benefit, it's a security drawback because it increases your risk of users responding to a phishing attack, uh, MFA stuffing, um, all of those sorts of attacks. Because if users are just used to getting hit all of the time and doing it mindlessly, then they don't apply rigor to what and when they get asked to sign in versus a user who gets to ask sign in very infrequently will look at that pro- prompt more and kind of make sure that it, that everything is copacetic and it's it's what they should be doing. So we we have um, a, a, a plenty of information at Microsoft that suggests that 
forcing frequent reauthentication is not always beneficial. So again, this is a balancing act like everything in cybersecurity. We absolutely do want to protect against those unattended devices scenarios, but at the same time, we don't want to burden our users with having to reauthenticate all of the time because that's not really helpful. It's actually better to implement that at the device level than at the service level. So what I mean by that is your PCs should automatically lock after so much idle time, and then users have to reauthenticate at the, the Windows sign-in screen. And that's fine, uh, but that's better than doing at the service level. And if you're doing things like Windows Slow for Business, that user sign-in at the sign-in screen can actually satisfy a multi-factor authentication um, prompt right then and there, because Windows Slow for Business is considered multi-factor authentication. So a little bit of a tangent there on my soapbox a little bit, but always like to clarify that because sometimes I see uh, IT security departments get really excited about the option to make people put in their password 30 times a day. And I'm just going to tell you right now that that actually does not help your security posture. So don't do that. I'm going to add to that because this is a fun story. And, you know, Adam and I have mentioned multiple times that, Microsoft for us has moved to a passwordless, um, you know, authentication. And so very rarely in our day to day, are we ever asked for a password? I don't remember the last time I entered my corp password in for a Microsoft application. However, it's part of that. What, what you were talking about, Adam, is, you know, being able to sort through those signals of, you know, did I just get an MFA prompt or did I have to enter in my password or, you know, why is this asking me to reauthenticate that sort of thing? And if you're constantly having to do it, you're just kind of like on autopilot and you're just kind of doing it. And you may just inadvertently put in your password into some random application that is asking you. Mm-hmm. And so the fun story is I joined you know we talked about guest users a few few weeks back i joined to another tenant using my corp credentials for another organization that i'm working with and that organization has mfa set up but they don't have passwordless authentication enabled and so when i'm signing into that tenant i'm authenticating using my microsoft credentials but it's asking me to enter in my password every single time. And so the first time that happened, I was like, whoa, what is this? This is strange. Mm -hmm. Why is this screen prompting me for a password? And, you know, I realized it was signing into the other tenant. And so I had to enter in my password. They would prompt me for MFA on my Microsoft side, but every single time it's asking me for a password. So, you know, that to me is just kind of one of those things that's, because Microsoft uses passwordless, that was a signal to me to just stop and say, hmm, this is strange. Let me make sure that this is correct. And so that's what Adam is talking mm-hmm. about here is frequent prompts are not always good. If you're always prompting for your password, if you're always prompting for MFA, then you're just mindlessly putting it in. But in this case, I'm never asked for my password. So this time that I am, I paused, verified before I proceeded. Love it. That's a great real world example of uh, kind of the, the point we're making here, which is some security concepts are actually what we call like anti-patterns where they're actually not beneficial. You know, another great example of that is with password complexity requirements, how they lend or they lend themselves to users creating predictable passwords because they like to do, you know, uppercase, lowercase letter, 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 number, maybe two numbers, and then a symbol. And and so instead of it creating the effect of um, adding more complexity and entropy to passwords, it's actually helped us predict with a high level of accuracy in each position what, what a user is going to use. They're almost certainly going to do that because humans think that way. You know, they think of words start capitalized and then they go lowercase and then I'll throw some numbers on at the end and then I'll throw in a symbol because that's like what punctuation looks like, you know? And, and so that's another great example of it sounds on paper good. Oh, we're going to have more possible characters at each position in the password. So as opposed to 26 or 52 options here or 62, if we add in numbers or who knows how many have we add in symbols? I don't even know. You know, I guess it depends on your character set. 
it's, it doesn't work that way in practice. It actually reduces it where we can predict, you know, again, um, even with symbols, users are only going to use the ones that are like in the top row of the keyboard, right? They're not going to go into like the character map or something and pick out some, some esoteric character. So same kind of concept applies. If you're thinking about this purely as a math problem, instead of as a human problem, that's where the challenge comes in. And so if you think of, oh, we'll make people sign in more frequency that frequently that way we know it's them. Um, in theory, that that may be true, but in reality, it, it creates undesirable human behaviors. And that's what we're getting at is ultimately we're securing people, not just systems. And so we have to think of that human computer interaction as part of our system design. Good stuff. A little bit of a tangent <laughs> at the end, but I love the discussion and Absolutely. conversation that's our show for this week thanks for watching and listening our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions or future show topics you want us to talk about thanks and we'll talk to you guys next week thank you for listening to the blue security podcast please check out the show notes catch up on episodes you may have missed and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes find andy on twitter at ajaw zero and adam at aj brewer See you at our next episode.